there we go. A little bit of a lag, but that's fantastic. OK, so that's beautiful Saskatchewan. That's what a lot of people say. Um, we're waiting for an advancement. So as I went through, I do a lot of crops in Saskatchewan. I've been here for a bit of time. Uh, the contact information is available and it is fast editing forward through. OK, there we go. Thank you very much for doing that. Um, now, the province, this is from one end of the province to the other, so it's the entire area. So there's a lot of diversity in the product as well as the location. With 1.2, 1.3 million people in the province, it's small markets, but they're fantastic markets. Um, so we'll work on developing a few of the topics with that in mind. Okay. So the one thing is starting today is minus five, 25 outside. And although it is sunny, it's a little crisp. Where the wonderful greenhouse industry, it's 20 degrees year round, and you only get rained on when you do something wrong with the irrigation system. So no, it's a beautiful working environment. Um, we do have year round producers going throughout the province. Um, so it is viable to a year round greenhouse production. Okay. Wait for laying. Now with this, we're gonna cover quite a few different crops. We'll try this again. Thank you very much. OK, but I start off most of my talks and all my presentations with have your water tested. OK, this is the biggest thing that can go wrong is not doing the water test before you actually set up the greenhouse. OK, because if you go through this process. Make sure that it's for greenhouse um, use, not just farm use, not whether it's palatable or not, whether it's drinking water or not. Um, there's a lot of difference for greenhouse production. You're not dealing with much substrate, soil, media, okay? So the quality of the water really counts, okay? Also, the amount of water that you have. Now, a full-size tomato plant can use four to six liters of water per day each plant. So that adds up very quickly. And we're going to try... Ah, oh, it did fit for it. Thank you very much. OK, so the thing is, a greenhouse is controlled by who are running it. There's a little bit outside sun and the heat and everything does come into play with it or the outside cold. But the inside and the growing area, we have toys to make sure that you do. And it behaves the way you want it to or close to it. OK, so lighting, we have artificial lighting as well. Now, the thing is, um, you can use that to your advantage as far as doing even the lighting through the evening and get two and a half days of growing in a two day period. So it is plants do need that dark period to reset. OK, but you can extend the growing area and growing time longer. OK, on the top of the thing we have energy curtains. Now that's something to really consider in this environment. OK, they have three or four different kinds out there, the ones that are here at the U of S um, has a strip of silver, a strip of clear, a strip of silver, it repeats. The clear lets the sunlight in. So in the summertime, you close it and you actually keep the heat out. There's enough sunlight coming through with half the light making it through to grow the crop very successfully, but it reduces your heating cost for keeping that heat out, okay? So now this is part of that is in the winter time you close it and then you're heating less area um, now with that do not open them quickly because that cold air above can actually come down onto the crop uh, and do some damage so it is it's all mechanized it opens slowly after the sun comes out for a bit and heats it up but the savings of the energy curtains over time is fantastic they are expensive to go in, okay? And that's about the next one over is the optimum temperature. And that is our coal, our key is to keep those plants in the max min temperatures for maximum production over a period of time. Cost effectively okay, is, is the key part of that, okay? We go down to the next one, it says training. Now this was a training exercise at the U of S. I was in a DOP project, agricultural demonstration, um program 
And the gentleman facing us is Dr. Ken Fry out of Alberta. He's one of the most fantastic bug guys that you ever run into. And he's working with some students and some growers on teaching record keeping and identification, stuff like this. It was a fantastic day. He's facing us, so I'm pointing him out because I used him on the slide. The other one is best management practices, okay? Now, if a producer decides to use uh, pesticides, insecticides, fungicides, that's fantastic. If they choose to use biological controls, that's fantastic. If they use a combination of them, these are their choices. Um, I'm just here to help you with what choice you make, doing it the most effective way we can, okay? We do a lot of education as far as the groups and presentations on biological control, which I'll get to in a bit, okay? The next one is water. Mentioned about making sure it's good quality water. That's my, my little mantra. But it's giving it constantly low amounts so that way the plant doesn't dry out or get waterlogged and drown the roots. Okay. Now, how you water is very important in a greenhouse. Okay. The plants will adapt to you. If you're a heavy waterer, you'll end up with really fat roots, very small feeder roots. Okay. If you end up with a dry grower, you'll end up with a whole bunch of fibrous roots and not very many fat roots. Okay. Both work because the plant has adapted to you. The only thing is, if you have an alternate or somebody who's looking after the crop, make sure that they water in the same practice you do. Okay. Now, that's getting a little deep on the production side, but those are key aspects of this. Record keeping. Okay, for temperature, uh, fertilizer, insect. So that way you can predict what things are gonna happen for the next couple of years and keep going track of it to see where the trends are. Every year is different because the outside is different, but it does help, okay? Scouting is what they're doing here is they're looking for bugs, okay? Um, in a greenhouse, there's some key uh, villains that come out on a regular basis, um, but you, you have to spot them early. So training your staff to be able to identify them in the greenhouse is one of those key aspects, okay? Sanitation is huge, okay? Several different aspects. It takes a slip on this one here. You also have disease. I think, Glenn, oh, you're muted. OK, that helps a lot. Thank you. Um, hopefully, I wasn't being muted too long since the beginning, maybe. Nine. OK, do, how far do we want to go back? Uh, not very far. OK. I don't know who, how I did. I didn't touch anything. Anyways, you, you finished uh, scouting, I believe. You were talking about sanitation, Glenn. Thank you. Okay. No, I just all of a sudden was like, oh, did I miss everything? Okay. So sanitation down here is the blue sticky card. Okay. In most greenhouses or insect identification, you use a yellow sticky card. Most insects are attracted to yellow. Okay. So in this one, the blue sticky card is actually for thrips. Okay, there is a couple bugs in a greenhouse to do a lot of damage. And for the blue sticky card, thrips is one of them. It's a little high for where I put it with the crop, but it's nice identification. That's probably why it was stuck there is for a training mesh. Okay. Now we'll try the next slide. Okay. So we'll get into a little bit more in the crops. Okay. And with the bedding plants, we have wholesale production, okay, or grow cell production retail. Okay. Now, with the wholesale production, it's economics of scale, okay? We have some greenhouses um, in that five to seven acre range, and that is really good, okay? So they do supply the retail stores that just buy and sell, okay? And they do supply some of the smaller growers. This is a, an important part of the key, and also reduces how much product's being imported into the, into the province. So they're doing a fantastic job. And if you take a look at one of these trays, shipping trays, 
there can be retail probably two to four thousand dollars maybe five thousand dollars depending upon what's on it on one of those trays so this adds up as far as per dollar fairly quickly okay the picture of the gross sell operation is a 30 by 50 that's probably the, the entry level um because anything smaller than that the greenhouse heats up really quickly and cools down really quickly and that's hard in the plants okay and it's hard to manage it the smaller the greenhouse it is the harder it is to keep the environment control under under check okay so this one here has nice wide alleys for shoppers um, it's easy flow customer flow this is important it's about the first part of the season so just touch and base on a little bit of the difference okay now with the greenhouse the one thing to make sure that you've got it is space equals time equals money if you can make that equation work you'll be economically successful in the greenhouse industry okay this is an old photo it's fantastic but this is a un, well it's probably a 25 26 wide and 100 feet long and it literally had 14 inches of walk space okay and it was they were doing more or less a single crop of petunias and it's for supplying their other greenhouse and their retail place and this is their production and they're selling out of it but this is definitely one of those ones where space equals time equals money the uh, watering hose it's off to the side was actually on like a clothesline and it ran out and back so that they didn't even interfere with the crop okay so this is one of the ways that it's not high tech this is very low tech greenhouse but use optimum efficiency okay with this you take the other end of the thing this is a very high-end gutter connect greenhouse okay and they're taking a crop of hanging baskets from the ground moving them up into the rafters okay and this is where you're taking into effect into account turns of the bench okay so how many times you use that growing space so if you're able to put the hanging baskets from the bottom up top it does shade the crop underneath it okay so it does reduce a little bit of the light but the benefit of doing that second layer of crop is critical okay so this one here has root heat it has the little hoses at the back to go underneath and provide the heat up from the bottom okay that helps increase the root growth and the environment there and you're heating the area where the plants are and it raises up okay there is heating up top as well but that root heat is so important okay now okay so a beautiful crop for underneath there is pansies low light level okay so this is um a beautiful crop now i'd be lying but it'd be funny to add in this is for edible flowers and i'd love to see a crop like this for pansies for edible flowers okay it's we're not there yet okay but i have seen homegrown edible flowers at the farmer's market stuff like this it's a niche market but it is one of those things that shows the size um, of the markets in saskatchewan and the ability to grow mass so if you're doing large scale crops you end up having that ability to reduce cost of production and some efficiencies there okay talking about efficiencies okay now this one here got me in a lot of trouble when i took this photo um i had to sit there for about 10 or 15 minutes for the plant this transplanter to miss two grabbing two small seedlings so that i could take the picture to show how it was picking up the seedlings but they were thought i was taking the picture to show that the machine didn't work no the machine works wonderfully well okay but this shows you some of the automation that can be put into place okay so you can get transplanters put in to help that process okay with a labor bill um, is probably the highest one even over heating sometimes and the heating bill isn't cheap okay so looking at automation stuff like this for greenhouses is part of it as well okay um now taking a look at your dollars per square foot the photo below it has some beautiful flowers larger pots um 
data vine happening here, but it is one of those things looking at different crops that are newer varieties that bring those customers back in. Now this one here is actually, it's scary when you say that it's a $149 large planter and that's a cheap one, okay? Um, I walked through a garden center the other day and had a pot for $300, just the pot, not the plants in it, okay? So this is where, once again, looking at dollars, looking at customer flow, looking at reducing your cost of production, all these things are happening in the industry right now, okay? Now, value added and top shelf, okay? This is what brings the people up. So for pre-COVID, elf in the shelf for elf gardening um, was a huge aspect, okay? So this one here had um, a nice little display set up. It was so cute, I had to take the picture. Um, now that is, they come in, go as fads. So you have to pay attention to where stuff comes in and goes out. Um, but that is a gorgeous piece and it inspires them to say, if I buy this plant, this plant, this plant, and these little three gnomes and this, I can take this home and make my own gnome garden, elf garden, fairy garden. Okay, fairy garden is I think is the, the one that's in right now. Okay, so with these things, it inspires more sales. Okay, it, it gets people excited about coming back to your place because a lot of the other chain stores not, don't offer that. So it is one of these things of value added, okay? Now the one on the left-hand side with the little palm tree in the middle of it, that is not a picture of here because we've got some not hardy plants behind it, okay? But it was one of those ones where it has a beautiful pot, it has a, a, a tropical in the background and some flowers off the side, okay? This is something you can do because more and more garden centers are getting tropicals. So you take one tropical, three hanging baskets, and some annuals, and you can make that yourself. Okay. So these are ones, or you put that on display and have someone else sell it. This is things about making your home a little more beautiful, even more exciting. Okay. Talked about tropicals. Okay. With this, Okay, now I noticed that I'm actually traveling a little too fast on this one. But on Tropicals, this one was the biggest one over COVID that had the, the impact um, I, for myself that really jumped out. Um, now, in this top photo, you have spider plant here and there's a few Tropicals over here. Hanging basket, tomatoes, tumbler tomatoes. Okay, they cascade down. Um, they've I've seen mini cucumbers done in hay baskets like this. You have strawberries in this side, okay? So they're not tropicals, but it's hanging plants and plants that aren't usually used in the type of system, okay? We're very strong. Actual tropicals themselves. Um, there is uh, one of the larger greenhouses, garden centers. Um, their sales went up by 10 times over COVID for tropical plants. So people stuck at home, working from home, um, these things brought in plants to be around them through the winter time when they couldn't travel, stuff like this. That was a huge spike. Um, how long that will continue, I don't know, but it is one of those things that had a huge, huge spike, okay? Now, the one on the bottom, this actually is a production facility uh, in Saskatchewan. Uh, these guys here were brought in as cuttings and grown on. Same with the ones above, okay? So this is, there is a lot coming in straight from California, but there is also local production of these, okay? Fantastic market, new and exciting things. Okay, tomatoes. We're going to cover a whole bunch of different aspects of this. This one here, I'll pause and, and do a little bit of a, a jaunt on it. Um, we're taking a look at um, food security, okay? A lot of times you couldn't find uh, vegetables or can of whatever that you wanted in the grocery stores in Regina and Saskatoon. This is what a lot of the northern communities deal with all the time, okay? Or it's very, very expensive, okay? So these are some of the aspects that has really brought to our attention. Now this one on tomatoes, I'll do a little bit of a, a chat on this one. So. We've changed it just from the standard red tomato, the yellow and the gold, okay, different varieties, still a tomato, okay. Now, I don't know if you know it, but 
a lot of times they'll bring them in green because they're hard. They can be shipped easily. They won't damage. They won't bruise okay, as badly. But if you cut into them and the seeds are green, they've been artificially ripened. Okay, so that acid is still very strong. It hasn't had a chance to ripen and turn into sugar. So a lot of times that actually upsets your stomach. Okay, so it's one of those things that a lot of people, once they taste vine ripened greenhouse tomatoes, they'll always go back to it. It's worth a couple dollars more than the stuff that's imported in. I don't even classify them as the same vegetable. Okay. It's our fruit. It's the the beastie is completely different. Now, the other thing is the calyx, the little green part on top here. If that's attached, you can guess how old that is by how green it is. So it gives you an indication of how long it's been off the plant. Okay. So a lot of times they'll remove that so you have no indication to see how old that is. The other thing is that little stub um, also jabs into the other fruit. So sometimes they'll reduce it, remove it so they don't damage other fruit. Okay. With this, tomatoes are your biggest crop as far as the volume goes and Saskatchewan as well. So with the tomato plants, they'll get now i would say 25 feet long but that's eight meters okay so tomato plant getting eight meters long and you should be getting between 25 kilograms per square meter to 50 kilograms per square meter now if you're doing co2 and other injections you can raise that even higher okay but for production i think that that's about where you're at okay now with this um, let me do it quick. Okay. There is Canada Gap. Okay. So when you're taking a look at food production for other people to eat, Canada Gap covers most of the systems. You have an inspection, so you're certified. And if you're certified, it's not a regulation for the province or federal, but a lot of the chain stores and that will not buy from you unless you're Canada Gap certified. It's their insurance to make sure that you've made it as safe as you can. Okay. So this is where um, I'll pause. I did see Ross point out. Are there any particularly blow ground or dug in greenhouses used in commercial production in Saskatchewan? Okay. Now we have had uh, greenhouses in a mine shaft. Okay. Um, that was cannabis when it first started like 20 years ago. Okay, so it has been done in Saskatchewan. Dug in, okay. Now, if you dig it into the ground, and there's been a couple in Alberta that I've run into, the problem is you do use a lot of water, okay? And when you build, dig it down, you re reduce the heating cost, but all the water that comes off the roof and everything else usually ends up in the floor. So you're ending up pumping out a whole bunch of water, okay? So that's the dig in problem, is you actually start to deal, you you create your own issues with that. So I've seen it done in Alberta. I haven't seen any in Saskatchewan. As far as underground itself, I've seen one in a mine. So hopefully that helps you, Ross. Um, let's see here. Now in Saskatchewan, Saskatchewan's own greenhouse tomatoes. Okay. Um, it is um, a fantastic thing. We We grow some amazing stuff, okay? The peppers, the sweet bell peppers on the side, it is one of those things that you can't get the yellows and the reds um, in the field because we don't have enough heat units, okay? If you do it a high tunnel or a greenhouse, you can get those colors, okay? Um, this just happened to be what was on this, this grower's desk at the time, so this is the photo I got, okay? So during COVID, well, before COVID, we'll go back before COVID, long English cucumber rule, okay? It was the greatest thing. Then came along the mini cucumber, which is down the corner, uh, down here. Now these guys here, um, kids would eat them. You can put them in their lunch, they take it in. It's great, it's fantastic. If you're uh, a small family, one or two people, chop those up, dice them up in a salad, it's great. A long English cucumber may take you three days to eat it, okay? So they hit their mark and the demand was was flourishing quite well before COVID hit, okay? When COVID hit, Saskatchewan's market maintained the same, 
Okay, yet places like Ontario and stuff like this, the mini cucumber demand actually crashed because the kids weren't going to school. So it's easier to take along English cucumber when you're feeding everybody when they're staying at home. Okay, we didn't see that here and the mini cucumbers are recovering across Canada. Okay, so the thing is mini cucumbers, long English cucumbers are short crop, relatively speaking. So um, for production days, um, we'll run between three and four crops of cucumbers in a greenhouse for a year round production. Uh, where peppers, you would do uh, one crop, usually seeded January 15th, and you've got about 80 days to hit production. Then you'd transfer that over into targeting for your market. Is it farmer's market? Is it direct to a store? So you work that out, and usually it goes till November, December. Okay, with tomatoes, it's the same thing. Seeding in January, March type area and harvesting all the way through to November, December. Okay. Now the um, I'll get into a couple th other things is uh, long age cucumber. Um, best guess is one cucumber per plant per week. Okay. The mini cukes, these things branch out, send it their weed that goes all over the place, okay? Takes a lot of management as far as pruning that goes, but it's about one mini cuke per plant per day. And if you're doing everything especially well, you actually have to pick twice a day because these things just keep producing. It's fantastic, okay? Now, the other one is the tomatoes, okay? Now I have the cherry tomatoes down here and I love to see them. There's a high demand for this. When they're shipped in, in a large container, they're touching a lot of the others. So if one goes bad, they'll take 50 others with it. These are all touching. Where a full-size tomato is only touching three other tomatoes because they are gap around them. So you only lose three or four. So the imported stuff has to put a high price on these cherry tomatoes because of the loss of the spoilage being shipped in from distance. If it's coming from Edison Hat, they don't do that. But if they're coming in from Mexico and stuff like that, there's a high loss. There's a high labor in picking these. So these are more expensive. But once you've had a few in a salad, they're fantastic. Okay. So this is a really good market for us right now. Um, with that, okay. The, I just do a check. Uh, I got stuff coming up, so I won't go there yet. Okay. Um, with these in production, okay. Here's your cucumber. This is the this is the crop. This is the next crop. So you stagger your crops a little bit. So when you take out to put in your new crop, you're always in production. Okay. So there's a metal rail going down both sides. This is to reduce your labor. Okay. This the small one. It's you can put your your bucket on it. You can put your clips. It's your daily work back and forth. And I'll get into picking in a second. You've got a yellow sticky card to scout for insects there. Okay, good air movement here. Um, these, this is a nice long English cucumber there and a mini cute there. Okay, so there's not much difference in the plants themselves. Visually. Okay. Now those rail systems can save about 30% of your labor. Okay. Now this innovation, this is a producer that uh, has, has since retired. He's fantastic. This scissor list is what you'll get in Ontario in the 10 acre greenhouses and stuff like this, okay? But this producer uh, built this uh, homemade version. It's got a solar panel. It's got a car battery, a little electric engine, a forward and backwards device, and it goes shooting up and down the rows. It's very solid, won't tip over. I love the sketch and pride. Okay, he never had to charge the battery once, it was all solar powered, okay? Through that, he reduced his labor by a third, okay? This is a very expensive piece and has to be charged every night, okay? So I love Saskatchewan, I love these guys just thinking outside the box. This is a heating system from a boiler, it comes up, the hot air is forced through your line, okay? Um, so this is, we'll, Touch a little bit on heating in a bit, but I just wanted to point out this heating system here. Okay. Okay. 
So now the other issue with COVID, um, at the end of it, we got hit with a impatient necrotic spot virus in California. Okay, it hit one of the the massive growing air areas. Okay, so they lost a million dollars worth of revenue that year being hit. Okay, so this top corner is what they look like in California. This is a disease that's going there. A virus is very hard to control and it's spread by insects. This is not a we'll we'll spray deal with it and get it done for next year. This is a long term problem. Okay. So in Saskatchewan, we've got a few things happening, okay? This is a flood system, or there's a deep root, which they have, you know, two, three feet of water. The styrofoam sheets that is growing on top of it, okay? With that, um, you have a fairly good production system. It's, uh, you have to aerate it to make sure that you end up with a really good um, root system on these guys. It's very key. Um, you also have, this is an indoor growing facility. It's a, inside a building, okay, one level. Um, this is a shipping container system that is actually way up north, um, attached to a school. And it's about, uh, was donated with funds for food for, for the kids. And it's teaching aid. It's, it's doing some wonderful things up there, okay? But lettuce has skyrocketed in price. Okay, if you can find it in the market. Okay, so these are some of the things that uh, there has been a few producers that had some empty space that have turned over into lettuce production because it is such a quick crop and there is such a demand for it right now. So we'll see how this one plays out later this year and see whether there's more interest in lettuce, okay, or leafy greens, okay. Now, when we're talking about this, marketing, okay. So we used to be able to just sell it to the grocery store and they put it there. But the thing is, if you don't have a label on it, they will pick it up and when it hits a till, it will go through as a field vegetable, which is about half the price. You don't want that. So labeling on this is important, okay? So the self-scan comes into effect, okay? Now the federal government was looking actually including this packaging this wrap around the cucumber because it loses moisture. If it's not wrapped, its quality degrades quickly. Okay, so it's actually wrapped and they were classifying that as packaging. Then we'd actually have to go through the packaging regulations, which is huge. So the associations across uh, Canada, as well as the National Association, got together, lobbied the government and has slowed or stopped that process. Okay. This would also include the little rubber bands that go around broccoli. Okay, so um, there was some really good movement by the industry on this uh, to keep this in place. Now, underneath here, I, I blacked it out, but that was a producer's name for traceability on food safety. Okay, so these are things that are important. And Saskatchewan's own uh, is a brand for the Saskatchewan Greenhouse Growers Association. Okay, but I think it's fantastic that they've put this together as well as the growers are showing that the pride in Saskatchewan, which great marketing, okay? Now, in this, you've also got a lot of development in field vegetables, okay? Now, that has soil and dirt, okay? I, I Yeah, I'm scared of that stuff. Don't touch that stuff, okay? But that's a market for the greenhouse guys are producing seedlings to be put outside. So as that field vegetable market continues to grow and continues to benefit, so does the greenhouse industry as far as supplying them seedlings that, or in this case, the producer themselves have set up a greenhouse to produce their own seedlings, okay? So this is that very tight knit community between field vegetable and greenhouse vegetables. Um, and if you can get into the market, before the other guy, you'll get a better price. If you can produce something that needs extended heat units starting in a greenhouse, fantastic. So these are some of the solutions that a guy can get going in a greenhouse to help advance different uh, vegetable reduction communities, okay? Strawberries, okay? Now, strawberries have been researched, looked at, kicked around, 
um, for the last 25 years in Saskatchewan. One of the first research projects I saw was greenhouse and strawberry production. Okay, this one is still a hot topic. Um, this is a new variety. Um, I was excited. I think it looks fantastic. Smaller, tasty, okay, but really good for indoor production. Okay, so these are some of the things. There's three different kinds of strawberries. I will not bore you or go into depth because that's for scarfs area, uh, the fruit specialist for the Ministry of Ag. My thing is controlling the environment for these to do the best it can. There has been some larger production go into strawberries in the last couple of years. There's other people who are looking at it. There has always been some production in Saskatchewan, but um, with the price of them, it's becoming more of an attractive um, product. Also, with some of the food safety scares in the States, um, people are more aware of it, hits media, stuff like this. It increases the demand for that local product, okay? Now, niche crops and value added, okay? The, these are fantastic things. Um, so the top one was, um, let's bell pepper and hot pepper uh, made into jam. So in their overproduced, ugly fruit is another term for uh, misshapen fruit, stuff like this, they would put into jams, jellies, added value, and instead of reducing the price, actually increase the price. I'll do a plug for the food center in Saskatoon. They have some wonderful programs that are working. Awesome it is a woman entrepreneur, and I don't know the rest of it off the top of my head, a uh, group that uh, agricultural women entrepreneur, no, it's not coming into it. Okay, but it's at the food center, it's fantastic. Um, they'll help producers with the labeling, okay, requirements. If you have a recipe and you want to make a commercial recipe, they'll work with you, okay? They actually will rent uh, equipment to do small batches such as this so the producer doesn't have to buy their unit outright, okay? So it has some really cool aspects that there is a period in time where your feet, like your garden vegetables hit the market. Okay. Yes, Grant, I'm not taking bad of you. This is in addition to you, okay? When those products come on, the greenhouse price drops. A lot of producers won't drop their price, but they'll value add that extra product for later sales. Because after the first frost, wait seven to 10 days, the price spikes again. You wanna be in full production when that price spikes. So you don't wanna go out of production when the field of stuff is being harvested or farmers, your garden stuff is being harvested, okay? So this ties into the flow. Also value added additional market is fantastic. Hot peppers, um, ethnic foods. Um, I was dealing with some China product that there is no English name that he knew of for what he was growing. Um, there, it, it tasted fantastic. Um, it was actually in the uh, a wholesale, um, a chain store, grocery store in Saskatoon. Uh, it had Chinese lettering for it. It had no English on it at all. Um, it was selling really well. So, I mean, these are aspects that um, the doors are opening for this stuff, okay? Herbs have been strong and, and increasing in, in popularity. Um, one of the producers that I love did fresh at the market, did whatever she didn't sell fresh, she dried. Whatever she didn't sell dried, she made teas out of. So you had fresh dried and tea. And she make it, made it into the wholesale market, the farmer's market, high demand at the gate as well. Uh, wonderful full market access, okay? And with the local demand, this is only gonna increase. Okay, I hit the button once, we'll wait another second. Hit it again, there we go, okay. Now, I'm gonna to touch base a little bit on this. I had a little bit more of a chat to, to babble about this, but uh, Philip Harder is gonna happen right after lunch, and he's gonna talk even more on this, but once these guys grow up, okay? I'm gonna keep the little guys, he's gonna take it from there. Okay, silviculture, reclamation, shelter belts, tree seedlings, okay? All this comes into effect, okay? Now, I'm trying to, um, 
I think we're at 15 million trees, 12 to 15 million trees in Saskatchewan. Uh, that's off the top of my head and I didn't prepare for that. So if it's wrong, my my uh, my apologies. Uh, but there is some several million trees growing in Saskatchewan. Um, when you take a look at this, the CO2, um, carbon credits, stuff like this will play into production of this. Um, now we've got biodiversity is is huge and you talk to some of the farmers in this i think that's great and uh thank you timothy on the food center info um you take a look at the habitat for predators to take out the gophers that are running amok in your crop and stuff like this your protection for your livestock your crop as well as your home okay now we've had plow winds in saskatchewan it helps reduce your heating bill your cooling bill you're talking uh, with Grant about urban forestry. It's still all that around your home on the farm as well. OK, even more so because it's all by itself to protect. OK, so that produces a microclimate. Now, this is um, a very um, easy and hard crop to grow. The thing is, the plant height and diameter has to be right on. Otherwise, the snow load will flatten the tree seedling then it comes up and sways back and forth and it actually really impacts the, the longevity of the tree and the health of the tree so although it seems easy it's it's a very technical crop to grow okay um so those there isn't many producers uh but they're doing a fantastic job here in saskatchewan okay now part of that is we had about 10 or 12 years of very low cone production, okay? Um, for cone production, the trees have to go through a couple things, okay? Either a really, really good year, and they're going, woohoo, we'll produce seeds, and it's such a great environment, they'll flourish, they'll grow, life is good, okay? They'll, they'll go into seed production. Or we're gonna die, we have to produce seed before we die, okay? This last year had a bit of both. Oh my God, we're going to die. Then it got really, really nice. So the trees put the most outstanding cone production I've seen for a long time. Um, it was outstanding. Okay. Now we got into this conversation like, yeah, so, okay. But if you're doing those trees seedlings that you saw before, you're talking between four and eight hundred dollars per pound. Okay. Now I'm using pound bees. That's what the industry uses. Now, each pound has about, well, a thousand seedlings, okay? Seeds in it that grow. So it's not cheap. And you wanna make sure that you actually have access to the seed that's hardy for here and were fantastic trees. So they were actually harvested from specimen trees and um, SAS Power, the nursery uh, um, producers, and uh, the Christmas tree growers did some fantastic harvesting this last year. Okay, so most people don't pay attention to that, but for these guys and those tr small little tree seedlings, it's a lot of work to get that. Um, you can just see the sap oozing off these cones. They are sticky, it is nasty, um, and it's high off the ground. So not easy on to, to acquire it. But worth a note that last year was an amazing crop. Okay. So for this one, I'd love to have one of those ones. Put up your hand, because I miss being in person, and say, kill it or not, okay? Is this something that you saw in your greenhouse? Would you squash it, okay, or not? Now, I've seen this thing referred to as a dragon, okay, because it eats everything, okay? But usually, it's all the bad guys it eats, because it's a baby ladybug, okay? So, yeah, there you go. <laughs> so these guys here eat a few bugs, but their babies do an amazing job. Okay. So these things of I've got a call thing, my greenhouse is infected, we have to kill this thing. And I'm like, no, 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 these are the bestest buddies you'll ever have. Okay. So now through this, these are all ladybugs. Now there's some ladybugs who love trees, there's some ladybugs who love grass. There's some ladybugs who, you know, have different features, okay? So the stuff that's brought in are usually from a higher altitude and a more aggressive beastie. 
So there are some people that saying don't use ladybugs because they're they're pushing out the local guys. OK, there's others that are saying we use ladybugs because we don't want to spray chemicals. OK, I'm not the person to say right or wrong. This is the more you know, the better it is. OK, but all these guys are ladybugs and they do a fantastic job. You can buy these guys in for greenhouse production. Release them in the crop and they do a wonderful job of usually aphids is their main chewing toy, but they'll do a lot of other things as well. OK. Saskatchewan is expanding. OK, we have a lot of new greenhouses starting up and going. Um, wonderful header house storage facility for actually field vegetables as well. Um, no, this is we're seeing a lot more expansion in this industry. OK. Now this is a throwback. Um, this is me when I had red hair. Um, I miss those days. Um, so this is over in Beijing. But in Saskatchewan, we're seeing a lot of interest in solar greenhouses. OK, um, the angle of the roof is a key aspect to it. OK, and in China, you'll usually end up with a covering on the outside that they roll down like a blanket. Uh, they try and experiment one in Manitoba. That doesn't work here. It rains, then you can't roll it back up and when it freezes and they had a lot of issues. But if you take the same idea and put it on the inside like a energy curtain, you have that effect, but adapted for Saskatchewan. OK, so this is one of those things that it's uh, being looked at really closely. Your back wall is an energy sink, so it absorbs the heat from the sun. Then at night it gives it back. OK, um, so that is one of the things. Well, all this is controlled environment, whether it's inside, outside. So I'm loving it all, uh, Scott. It's um, this is increasing. Um, the market is the issue that we have. It's a diversity of distance. So for food, yes. Um, as far as food going, um, people want to buy local. People get a lot of information on what's happening. And that taste difference between what's shipped in and what's growing here, people are seeing the benefit. They're also seeing about how much pesticides and that are used globally, and they're concerned about their kids. So they'll eat the stuff shipped in, but they're actually buying locally grown stuff with reduced pesticides for their families. So this is increasing this demand. So I am seeing more vegetable farming going up. Okay, so talking about environment. OK, now we've got biomass. Uh, we've got one biomass greenhouse for sure. A couple others, but one big one. Uh, this one here was using flax straw. OK, um, they actually have a cow copper, cow, cow calf operation. So there's a, a tractor here for moving the hay bales. It's started every day to feed the cows. So to fill these boilers with a round bale each is easy. Um, how much air they pump through them is how they control how fast it burns. This pile of ash um, was uh, from the fall to about April, and that's the amount of ash that was produced. OK, so it's not that much. And instead of burning the flax out in the field, because it can't be used as food or bedding for animals that easily or at all, um, it's used to heat the greenhouse. OK, but it has to be dried effectively or otherwise it reduces your BTUs, OK? And I'm getting close to my time. OK, cannabis, it's happening in Saskatchewan. Um, if you get your license, it's a long process. We've lost a few operations in Saskatchewan. That's more of the big players fighting it out. Um, that's about all I got on here, OK? The other one is research, OK? Saskatchewan, as this is SIA, um, we're looking at a lot of research for breeding new varieties, um, varieties with different traits. Your uh, pesticide resistance, um, pesticide, um, the research aspect that happens in Saskatoon is huge. Okay, so there's a growing demand also for this crop space and indoor production for for the field crops. Okay. Um, the, as far as I've heard, they've exceeded the space at the U of S and they're actually starting to um, look for more space. 
So this is where um, I wanted to toss in more or less a research facility kind of uh, layout because that is also a booming industry right now because people are trying to get the best next growing crop, increase production, increase yields, and increase the trades. Okay, so I should be, I was like a few minutes more than I wanted to, but any questions, this is my nine minutes um, to see whether I can answer any questions for you. No. Thank you so much for that, Glenn. Yes, if there are any other questions, I know that you were answering them as you went. Um, how many greenhouses are there in Saskatchewan right now operating? That is actually a really tough one that my bosses keep asking me, and I'm going, I don't really know. Um, no, it's um, according to Stats Canada, we've got 160. A lot of the numbers are producers that are part of the farm operation, so they put that as a farm versus a commercial operation. And there's a few that may not be reported. So my best guess is about 300 commercial greenhouses. Um, and once again, it's one of those things that um, for myself, it's 30 by 50 feet and $30,000 of income hits a commercial greenhouse. Okay. Okay. Um, got a question. I'll let you read that one. Yeah, uh, Patel, not not a question, but local production produce is great, especially in winter. We bought salad greens from Let Us Grow Hydroponics in Hudson Bay early this month, and hands down, it's the best salad greens we've ever had. Okay, now if you go back up to the lettuce slide, which we don't need to put back up, um, that bottom slide of the lettuce growing there, that was Lettuce Grow. Okay, so it's a actually repurposed school. And um, they've they're, they've moved into um, the cafeteria. Is their new research end of that? And they've got several of the classrooms converted over into production. It's fantastic. The guy's great. He's doing a wonderful job up there. Uh, Seth is wondering what's the fastest growing aspect of the greenhouse economy in Saskatchewan? Example: strawberries, biomass, lettuce. Well, over COVID, everybody was locked in. Okay. So when they're locked in, they can't travel. They focus on beautifying their backyard. So I hate to admit it, um, it was actually flowers and, and that aspect. People wanted to make their backyard beautiful, okay? So they went into massive production um, and instead of doing the one and a half turns of the bench, they were getting two turns, maybe two and a half turns of the bench. Um, there is a lot of interest in vegetable production and vegetable production is kicking in, uh, but with COVID, it was the bedding plants. The strawberries is one of those things that's getting a lot of attention um, and lettuce because of the disease and the shortage. It's definitely a, a small boom. Whether or not it will stay, I don't know, because um, if they get another move to a different field area, like up to Oregon, um that field production is hard to compete with the greenhouse but if you're buying it for taste for availability local you can't beat local okay um is there light pollution regulations here in saskatchewan that might hamper greenhouse produ production okay so this one here is um in ontario and bc ontario had it first and bc got it recently other way around bc had it first ontario got it recently is um you end up with a greenhouse that's been there for 15 or 20 years and the town more or less grows around it, then everybody's compl complaining that they can read their newspaper on their deck in the middle of the night because of the grow lights inside the greenhouse, okay? So the regulations in BC and Ontario say that you have to black out the greenhouse so that you're not doing light pollution on your neighbors, okay? Um, at present, those are the only two provinces in Canada that enforce the light pollution. Um, but it is one of those things that um, people are becoming more aware of, and I don't know when or if Saskatchewan will be there, um, but that is one thing that two other provinces have put into place. So it's a energy curtain looking thing, but it's solid instead of having the, the clear parts to it. Okay, it's a blackout. So you can use it to reduce the energy uh, for heating, so it's not bad, but that is one of the things, okay? 
Hopefully that helps. Okay, is there any other questions out there? Uh, Glenn, the Netherlands is the number two agri-food exporter in the world, largely based on their greenhouses. What do we have to do in terms of policy, investment, et cetera, to become Netherlands, North America? Okay, now, I love this because I get to geek out for a second. Okay, Netherlands and Canada, as far as I'm concerned, is bar none the best growers. Okay, Netherlands, it's a dollars per square foot investment. They have to make the most dollars per square foot to justify the greenhouse cost. Okay, so that's their initiative. Okay, now with the Canada, we like Saskatchewan, we have the high, high of 100 above and minus 50 below that we have to deal with. So we have to be good at what we do to, to navigate that. So we're the two best growers as far as I was concerned about the country goes. Down in Leamington, Ontario, um, they have the largest greenhouse area. And the thing is, they don't even supply Toronto. They leave that for the small ma and pa growers. Okay. In the Leamington area, they have five cities within five hours of over five million people per city. And they get the US exchange rate bonus on top of that. So that Leamington area is all shipping down to the States. Okay. So these are some of the things that they asked me how I can double my tomato production in Saskatchewan. My thing is you double the population, I'll double the amount of tomatoes, okay? Well, so, isn't, isn't Leamington, isn't that one the ketchup industry, right? It was, uh, there seemed to be a fight with the ketchup company and I won't, I don't know the details there, but that was, yes. Um, and that's field tomatoes as well. But those are some of the things that come into it. Uh, Sherry, there is a couple points set of producers. That one is really hard because a point center that was worth $56 is now worth $18. So we're seeing a lot of stuff coming in from the coast. Our product was three times better, but the thing is a lot of people won't pay for that. So we do still have a couple point set of producers, um, but even they buy them in then finish them versus growing them onward. It, other producers, if they're going to go for a full year production, they'll go into vegetable productions instead of putting a crop into poinsettias. I know I cried too. Um, indoor fruit. Okay. Yeah, so do indoor fruit vegetable facilities exist in SAS that operate and also sell produce in the winter? Okay. Um, the strawberries would be one. Um, as far as the, the other ones, um vegetables most definitely um in saskatoon there's four that i know of um we've got a few others outliers um the one in regina here uh, the two brothers aged out and, and retired recently it had nothing to do with market had nothing to do with it was just you know no we're retired okay um and it's on their farm and they didn't want somebody else on their farm running the greenhouse so they just shut it down okay um, there is another um, year round production facility going in to um, Regina Beach. It's in, it's in the making, I hope. Um, they're putting up greenhouse last time I talked to them. So it does exist. They are around. Um, the fruit side is what I was focused on a little bit, but the vegetables, most definitely. They are year round. They're going well. Um, there's another one in um, Humboldt. Most times they usually take a month off. Okay, from that first part of December to middle January, um, the prices crash because people are spending money on Christmas presents, not on, on high priced vegetables. And it's the coldest heating period and the lowest light. So with that, you have a chance to get the greenhouse clean, all the disease, all the insect looked after. Then you plant your, your new seedlings on January 15th and you get going for the next year. So it's, I say it's year-round production, and there is some that actually literally do year-round, um, but most take that little break, okay? Uh, and again, Kimberly Martin, what's the organization you mentioned that can help with labeling, developing a recipe? That's a food center again, yeah. Um, up in right, and there was a link that was added into the messaging earlier. Yeah, thank you again for doing that. Um, Ross McDonald, are there any federal provincial incentives to increase this production in Saskatchewan? 
Well, hey, um, the there's a couple that are going OK. Uh, there is federal uh, funding right now for northern food security and stuff like that. Definitely worth looking at. Um, there's a lot that's focused at uh, First Nations um, in that aspect um, because there's northern as well as communities that, that they're focused on. Um, the um, the Canadian Saskatchewan um, funding programs um, cap um, Canadian Cultural Partnership. They're ended at March 31st, so those programs are usually released shortly, but actually haven't. I haven't seen them yet. I see them when you see them. So please check the Ministry of Agriculture website and there's stuff there. And for R&D, um, it's called SHRED, Scientific Research Ed, um, Education Development. It's worth looking at as well, OK? Then there's ADOPT, Agricultural Demonstration with 